I'm John Cooper and with my wife Margaret Cooper we're here at FFI and we're with uh, Mark Rose who's the CEO of FFI, the Fauna and, Fauna and Flora International, which is incidentally the oldest international conservation body in, in the world. In the world, yeah. And very well known, a wonderful history. And we're here because at the end of November we'll be commemorating uh, the life of Maxwell Knight who died 50 years ago. He was a great naturalist. In recent years, we've realised that he was also a great spy master. But we want to talk today to Mark about Maxwell Knight, the naturalist, and indeed of the influence of naturalists in general on mm. people like yourself and myself and Margaret, who grew up in a somewhat different age of radio, television, when you had television, etc. Um, so that's really the background. And so might we start, Mark? You said foolishly, perhaps two or three years ago, oh, yes, I remember the influence of Maxwell Knight. Um, would you like to say a word, not just about Maxwell Knight, but if you want to bring in the names of that, some of the other naturalists of that era? Yes, I suppose I was probably, I was, one, I, you know, I was a small boy mm. at about sort of six, seven years old when I first remember my grandfather giving me an aquarium. And he said, there you go, um, you could put some fish in that. And I looked at it and thought, actually, I don't want to put fish in that. I, what I want to do is put some snakes and lizards and frogs and toads in that. And, I, and that was my first memory of, of thinking about herps, mm. so, so to speak. And then I, I remember getting very interested in, in reading up about them. And I think I had a small little observer's book. Yes. And that was my first, first, first read, I suppose, I, about I had the herps. same one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> little brown orange cover. That's right. And then I, then I discovered Maxwell Knight in my local library. And this, this particular book in particular, uh, Pets Usual and Unusual, was the first book I read of his. And it, and it inspired me to, 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 that inspired me and also made me feel that I wasn't odd. Mm. That, you know, none of my friends were actually collecting herps and, mm. you know, and could be seen picking up old bits of corrugated iron on, on <laughs> golf courses. Looking for you know, slow worms. <laughs> looking for slow worms, exactly. Yes. But yes. I was, and I felt unusual, mm. and I felt lonely. Yes. about that but he made me feel as though this was not unusual Absolutely. and that there were other people doing this so I, I thank him greatly for that also you know through his other books um, like my pet friends and um, the Nat young naturalist field guide we had um, he taught some very useful techniques things yes. that I didn't know things I learned and later on when I was a little bit older say uh, when I, was, I think I was about 13 I went to work for um, an organisation called Zoorama mm -hmm. in, in London, and they were importers of animals. And of course, I knew something about these animals because yes. I'd been reading Maxwell yes. Knight, my pet friends, and I worked there for a few years. And then I started to get really interested in what Jerry Durrell was doing mm -hmm. and going overseas collecting. So I ended up doing the same. So I became an animal trapper in West Africa for a while. In and, the footsteps of Gerald Durrell, in who was, the of course, the founder of Jersey Zoo. Yes. And we all read his books yes. in those days as well, didn't uh, we? But it yes. was total self-indulgence. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but you obviously enjoyed it. I loved it. And, yeah. and, and, and would you agree that Maxwell Knight, certainly I recall in radio broadcasts, that not only was it the point you made, you, you, you felt a bit lonely you were looking for your herbs and yeah. so on, but Maxwell Knight on the radio would sort of say, why don't you go out and look for poplar hawk moth caterpillars or yeah. see if the frogs are spawning yet? And I certainly felt enthused, encouraged to go and do that. Well, he gave you, he gave you cues, didn't That's he? That's right, he, yes. he, he gave you cues at the right time of the year so mm. that you learnt about the seasons and mm. the natural history of the animals through his radio yes. and, and where to look and what to look for. Mm. And I've still got my, my nature diary from that time. And I can tell you, you know, the first spawning in, in London of, of frogs was probably Wonderful. the 24th Wonderful. of February, Absolutely 1960, parallel to mine. <laughs> you know, and, and it's still there. And I wouldn't have that if it wasn't for him. Would you, would you agree we've got two enthusiasts here? It's, it's wonderful to see the common, the common roots and interests and the influence that uh, Maxwell Knight had on, on the two of you. It's a it's parallel paths. Slightly different times because Mark, of course, is a lot younger than I am. Yeah, I, well, I first met you, John. I was employed by you well, as I an did. animal technician and you were the vet in charge of the animal house. So. <laughs> and, I, and I was very impressed by your get up and go. And that, that, that's been proved. <laughs> Could I introduce one other thing? On the, one of the books you showed here of Maxwell Knight's, there's, there's hand lenses, and most mm. of us are, I'm carrying a hand lens at the moment. But one of the things that Maxwell Knight was very good on was what he called being a nature detective. And I don't know whether you were influenced by this, but even turning over the corrugated iron mm -hmm. uh, sheets. He, he inspired me to look in holes in trees, take bark off things, to investigate where other people didn't. 
And it's interesting in the, in the context of the symposium that there will, of course, be talk about his role as a spy master. And I often think he was using detective techniques both in the field as a naturalist and, when he had, and, and during those difficult days of the Second World War. For me, what he gave me was a good enough grasp of what was suitable habitat mm. for certain species that I know today. So I can go to an area today and I know roughly what I'll find there yes. if I'm lucky. Um, and I know what won't be there. And I learned that through tips that he gave me through his books, through the radio when I was growing up. Um, and I don't think you get that today. Like compost heaps for grass snake eggs and things like yes, that. Yes, <laughs> yes. Sort of yes. But there's some more subtle ones as well, mm. looking at the types of grass on a heath and, and, and such like. You're absolutely right, because John will say the same. We're going up, this would be a good place to see a lizard. This would be a good place to find an adder. Mm. And so that you really do have the same instincts. Yeah. And yeah. they must have mm. been fed by Maxwell Knight. And I think it'd be useful for those attending the symposium just to know a little bit more about your career. Um, yes, you started as an animal technician, which is, uh, we have an animal technician speaking then, talking about the care of animals, the humane yeah. care of animals. Um, but you then went on to do academic work. What, what, how did that go and, and how did well, you become ultimately the CEO of this organisation? Well, when I came back from Africa, having done a stint collecting animals, uh, mainly reptiles, as, mm. it, as it turned out, um, I, you know, I, I, I really then knew what I wanted to do and, and I wanted to be a zoologist. Mm at that time. Um, but I'd left school with very little qualification, so I had a sort of an issue there. And so I, I concentrated all my A-levels and O-levels into 18 months and worked in an operating theatre at night. And, um, and that sort of worked. I got, well, I actually got very bad grades, but... <laughs> but Here's a but, modest but, man. <laughs> but, but somebody somewhere had some faith in me, and that person was, was Dr. Pat Morris of Royal yes. Holloway College. Um, who a lot of you will be know of. Um, and who will, I think, be sending a message to the meeting because uh, he is again the chairman, pre president actually, of the Camberley Natural History Society, right. which was founded by Maxwell Knight, of which I as a member, and these are programmes from 1964 and 1968. Right. So there's a lovely link there. A lovely link. And, and Pat took a chance with me. Uh, initially, um, he, he sort of pushed me back and said, well, I don't think your grade's enough. You might have trouble with the course. But then he reflected on it and sent me a very nice letter saying, look, we'll, we'll take, a, take a chance and come on and start. And, so I, uh, and I wanted to go to Royal Holloway in particular because it dealt with the whole animal. Mm. Um, and it had some very good um, lecturers there on, on ecology and wildlife mm. conservation. Yes. And uh, so I went there and did my undergraduate degree. Yes. And, um, and then I, I, from there on in, I, was, I, I left Holloway and went overseas to uh, New Guinea. And um, I was luck very lucky uh, enough to get a job as a wildlife officer, district oh. wildlife officer in New Guinea. You're full and, of envy, of course. And then, and then I became a crocodile rancher. So I, I actually <laughs> developed the world's largest crocodile farm. This um, is much more fun than we expected. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I would be so impressed. And I, I had a ball, to be quite honest. There I was, a 24-year-old, uh, young lad in in the middle of nowhere in herpetologist's heaven yeah. absolute herpet <laughs> we had we had uh, rare turtles we had every bugs that you could consider mm. they all bit of course um, <laughs> but I spent three idyllic years in an area of the highest rainfall in in Asia Pacific uh, which a lot of people <laughs> would say you'll never laugh but I did and I enjoyed it I enjoyed it because of the crocs the turtles the herps and everything else so yes. I had a great time and the project that I was working on was a really good conservation project which stands up today. So when I went to New Guinea, the uh, population of crocodiles there was decimated. Yes. Uh, now today, there's a really good, healthy, strong population of both saltwater and freshwater crocs, which wouldn't have been there if we hadn't implemented the crocodile ranching program that we did. Can I just say that when I pulled out this book, Mark, to show you one of my Maxwell Knight books, this was a six shilling one that I <laughs> must have been given in about 1955, perhaps be <laughs> before you were... <laughs> well, it was a year after I was born. Oh, so. well, well, there we are. shows how old I am. But when I took it out, would you believe it, a, a card, a, a Christmas card fell out from Maxwell Knight from the uh, from the 50s and lo and behold I showed it to you earl earlier by it Morris a, Wilson it, yes absolutely a fauna preservation society oh. and it's in other words what later became because it's fauna preservation society then we, fauna and we fauna. started off as a society for the protection of the wild fauna of the empire right and yes. then we became the fauna society yes then we became the fauna preservation society then we became the fauna and flora preservation society 
And then in 1995, we became Fauna and Flora International. And I hope the name doesn't change again. And aren't we pleased it's got plants in it as well? It's so easy for people to be animal-centric. And the, habitat. The, it, the habitat is almost more important than the animals. There's Absolutely. No, habitat, yeah. no animals. Yeah. So. And we, we have a fund which actually buys up land around the world, an international yes, fund, yes, to preserve yeah, habitat. Yes, uh, yes. And we've spent probably nearly 200 million through that fund over the last few years. Uh, and so when you're looking for people for FFI to do projects, whether they're in this country or overseas, um, I don't want to put ideas into your head, but I mean, do you still have that sort of naturalist, herpetologist feel? We need someone who cares about the animals or the plants for their own sake. I mean, sometimes you can have a jolly good person on paper, but they don't have that little extra, the sort of sixth sense about animals and plants. Well, you know the difference. Mm. The, 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 the difference between having somebody who's uh, in, an innate good naturalist and somebody who isn't is huge. Mm. And yes. we, we really do talent spot mm. for these people. And often they're not properly qualified in, in the traditional mm. sense. You know, they don't have... Uh, a, a degree or, mm. or, or a further degree, but often they make the best yes. um, field biologists or conservationists. Mm. And so, you know, we do, so when, we, we, when we're looking at people, we look at the person. Mm. Uh, we don't always look at the qualifications. This will be music to the ears of some of the young people who are coming to the Maxwell Knight Symposium, who are students, some of them. Mm. Others are just keen amateur mm. herpetologists, entomologists, mm. botanists, whatever it is. And so many of those young people, don't they, mm. Margaret, say, I'd like to get a job. And we say, why did you start as a volunteer? And then mm. write to organisations and say what you can do, not just a list of qualifications. But I think you also have to take into account that, that um, conservation has become a much broader church. Mm. So we don't just employ zoologists, botanists, ecologists, those in the natural science. Mm. Um, we also employ sociologists, we employ economists, we employ lawyers, we employ um, financiers, I mean, yes. business people. Yes. I mean, it, it's so broad now. Uh, Biopoliticians, you know, I mean, it, it, it is a very broad church. We currently have about 500 people around the world employed. Uh, in 41 countries and, and with numerous professions within that lot. What I'd like to say to, to this audience here as, 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 a, as a bit of a finale is that, you know, hopefully amongst the audience there's some young folk who have ambition and interest. And if they've got that ambition and they've got that interest, they'll get to where they want to be. So don't be deterred. That is a wonderful ending. And, and a wonderful day. tribute to Maxwell Knight as well. Indeed. So. Um, could we thank you, Mark, for sparing time to tell us not only about FFI, but also about the, the factors, including Maxwell Knight, of course, that, that influenced you early on and, and, and led to what you're doing today? Absolute pleasure. As I said, I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but uh, I'm thinking of you. And we'll take um, some FFI literature and have it out <laughs> okay. on display. And, and, and the big thank you obviously goes to Maxwell Knight and other naturalists who've inspired us all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed.